Good morning. I'm delighted to welcome today David Howes, who's the Global Head of Financial Crime Compliance at Standard Chartered Bank. Good morning, David, and once again, thank you for taking the time uh, for the chat this morning. Morning, Vish. It's good to see you. Thank you, sir. David, as, as the Quantex uh, Standard Chartered Bank partnership continues to grow, you've gone through th about 13 years, right, at Standard Chartered, and you've seen a lot happen uh, within the bank, uh, especially within financial crime. Could you just give me a bit of a sense of this journey on, on when you started um, to where you are and some of the challenges um, that you have faced uh, through, through your time so far at Standard Chart? Okay, so uh, maybe, Vish, let's start with, with the problem. Um, and I think the problem is that uh, the system as a whole is not living up to the opportunities of using financial tools to tackle all of the harms that come from financial crime. So when I first got into this field, it was during uh, my time working in the UK government. And back then, I think it's uh, well recognised as being the case that the banks weren't doing enough. Over the, the last 15 years or so, I think that's fundamentally changed. So banks generally and Standard Chartered uh, uh, definitely have made significant investments in financial crime compliance tens of billions of dollars uh, uh, a year are getting invested. But the problem still remains. So at the end of all of that work as a, a, as a society, we're still confiscating maybe only 1% of the, the, the proceeds of crime. And so much of that investment that I've talked about, Vish, uh, goes to waste. Too much of our time is going to what a, a colleague of mine has described as chasing the innocent around the system. And I think that's because we've still got too many manual processes, silos in our data, but, but paradoxically too much data, uh, lack of a capability always effectively to integrate that and make, make uh, the best possible use of it. And that drives, uh, as I say, a, a significant amount of, uh, of wasted energy uh, to get to the actual financial crime cases that you know, true effectiveness requires us to get to. No, super, David. And, and I think some of those challenges around data, um, analytics, technology, process, as you say, you know, it's something not just within, say, financial crime, but, you know, in other areas as well. If you, if you fundamentally do not have access to the data or you can't call that data, or if those data is in different silos and you can't build that context and really truly understand the customer uh, behind uh, the transaction, it just makes that challenge, you know, 10 times harder, right? And, and my experience, obviously, with working um, with you and your teams is that Standard Charter Bank are truly in this sort of, I would say, evolution in, in, in taking and adopting such technology to, to, to be leaders and are leading uh, in this space. Again, over the sort of the last couple of years, maybe three or four now, um, how are you and how is the bank invested into sort of data analytics around joining some of this information together, um, enhancing your controls and your processes? Because again, you know, as a bank and as a team, you are leading in a number of ways here. So uh, it's a great question, Vish. Um, there's three areas I'd really highlight, particularly relevant to investigations, albeit we're, we're also innovating uh, around things like client onboarding. So the first is application of analytics. An example in this space is using data from many years of investigating many tens of thousands of alerts, identifying the ones that have a, a greater level of productivity and using that to risk weight those alerts and, and, and inform which cases get elevated for a human analyst to, uh, to investigate. I think the second area is the application of robotics and machine learning to automate more. So can we take, um, uh, take the human out of the process in, in some of those simple stages? Uh, and then the, the final piece I'd highlight is the work we're doing uh, with you on creating vastly better access to contextual information around a client. Uh, and it's that last piece that I think 
helps us do a couple of things. Uh, first, I think it can help standardize some of the volume work that we do by giving analysts better frames of reference for making decisions in relation to those alerts that are getting generated. Uh, the second area then is how we work more complex cases. So it's, it's enabling us to identify links between different actors in the system that we might not otherwise find. And I think that's really exciting. No, super, David. And, and again, I think you, you bring that very nicely together in those three sections. And with my journey with, with you and your team, one thing I would say, you have a vast amount of people investment that the team has done, right? You've got some of the, the best investigators, um, best uh, financial crime SMEs um, in, in the business. And, you know, as a bank, you're in, you know, 60 markets where actually your scale as a bank also, you've been able to harness and harvest into a, a advantage in tackling financial crime. Um, you know, I've seen, you know, a number of times where you've taken or the team's taken knowledge, um, both, you know, operational as well as uh, patterns and, and bring that to, 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 to a common good in tackling financial crime. So I would say, you know, as Standard Chartered Bank, you're really harvesting your scale for, for, the, for the benefit of tackling financial crime. Could you just give a bit of thoughts on how you've gone about sort of connecting, if it's connecting data from those different countries, but or, um, you know, bringing back together some of that process and some of that intelligent capital that you've built in country to much more help in a, in a group global function? Sure. So, so I guess first thing to say, I do think this is a space fish where there's always going to be more to learn. So, so the tooling around context and linking data points that we otherwise might not, that's, that's going to be the secret source for the future. Uh, an example I'd highlight in that space then that we've been uh, getting some, some good results from is starting to bring together transactional data uh, with channel data. So for example, if we identify a bad actor based on transactional typologies and the, the type of traditional AML rules that, that, that we run, we might start on the back of that looking at some of the other uh, counterparties that, that we identify in, in our bank um, and, and asking the question, are they also bad actors? Yeah. If, however, we start adding to that other data points, so things like common email addresses in CDD records across actors or common device IDs being used down uh, digital channels to access accounts, we might be able to identify and, and have had some experience identifying parties that you wouldn't necessarily show up through that traditional transactional analysis that are in effect going under the radar. And, and when we bring all of those things together, actually we get a much higher yield for the cases that we put together in, in terms of identification of suspicious activity that we can then take some action on. Uh, so it's, it's, I, th I think that's gonna be the future. It's how we bring uh, disparate data points together better to target the risk that some of the traditional techniques of themselves wouldn't wouldn't so easily uh, wouldn't so easily surface. So just just moving to to sort of outside the challenges and looking into things such as the trends and the patterns. One thing again under your leadership, David, and um, you know we've we've sort of worked together um, pretty closely on this is taking some of that knowledge and some of that experience from the investigations layer and almost bringing that forward into detection and monitoring. So for example, obviously as, as, you, as you know, we've been engaged with the bank around trade and looking at trade um, financial crime. And one thing I, I remember, and it was something that you, you said to me a few years back is, if you can somehow harvest and harness what an investigator in your in your team can do like in complex investigations um, and one of those investigators and look how they can investigate and alert but then 
almost programize that at volume, at scale, bring that together with machine intelligence that, you know, frankly, the human can't get to, but the machine can bring it to surface. If you can combine the two of them, then you're actually putting the best human in detection at scale. And what I've seen at the bank, you know, and, and again, it's, it's the tone at the top. You know, if I look at some of the stuff that your CEO of your bank has said around reshaping the organization, around, you know, taking this through the next journey of the bank. If you look at some of that pieces and those themes and bring it into your world, you're actually now doing that. You are bringing the best of a human, putting it into a system, and then you're now scaling that across the business. Can you give a bit of sort of thoughts and a bit of your thoughts around how that journey has happened and, and tell, us, tell, tell, tell us about some of your experiences there? Uh, okay, uh, it's a, I think it's a really exciting space um, and I do think it's the future, but, but as is often the case with the future, uh, you know, it's here in pockets, but it's certainly not everywhere. Yeah. Um, so I'm a great believer that one of the um, best ways to protect yourself looking forward is, is to learn from looking back and to, to learn from either what's got wrong, gone wrong or uh, where you've had success. Um, I think in terms of some of our investigations processes, um, the codification of output from that into how we generate alerts for investigation in the first place, I think we've had some, some good success from. But I think what can be even more interesting is taking uh, intelligence feeds the best ones come from law enforcement they come from outside the organization but but we also have a program that's that's horizon scanning and looking for how threats are changing so taking those kind of feeds and giving it to some of your more experienced investigators and giving them tooling to develop a hypothesis that they can then test against the data in the bank and see if we can identify uh, evidence that that hypothesis is, 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 is borne out. I think work of that nature, uh, where it succeeds, and it won't always, but where it does, uh, really gives you some food for thought around how do I now go back round into my more industrialized investigative processes, feed those results in, adapt the system further, and, and then you know, ultimately part of this is about chipping away at that false positive problem that we've that we've talked about before, so that more of the the talent and more of the human energy is going into activities that can generate really useful intelligence for law enforcement and help us as a bank um, manage some of those risks instead of going into recording why. Uh, that particular transaction was not suspicious in the first place, and 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 so that's 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 the goal for it. And I think, you know, the analytics approach, the use of experienced investigators, and frankly, some experimentation around hypotheses based on threats in the market, or threats going on in the world, that all of those tools have got a role to play in helping you move towards that goal. You've said this in some of your other interviews, you know. What is the consequences of getting this wrong? Some people feel it's a, it's a box ticking exercise, but I know at Standard Chartered Bank, um, and again, you know, something your, your CEO's mentioned in the past is, this is really important to the bank. Tackling financial crime is incredibly important. In one of your other interviews, you said, you know, to be the world leading bank, you also got to be world leaders in tackling financial crime. Um, and it's great to hear because I know this mission is not a box ticking exercise for, 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 for the bank. It, it, is, it is something that's very personal and something that you, you all want to achieve, which is fantastic. But could you just share to, to the team around some of the consequences of if you get financial crime wrong, just so that people are aware who might be new to looking at financial crime, um, what is the consequence? If we got this wrong, what, what is the impact to society? What is the impact um, to society when, when things go wrong from a financial crime perspective? If you share some of that views, please. It's really easy to underestimate, I fear, Vish. Um, 
I've heard things like fraud and money laundering described as victimless crimes, and that's not true. Yeah. Um, for any crime where there's a profit motive, and that's a significant number of crimes, uh, there's an opportunity to use financial intelligence in support of uh, detection of that crime, investigation of that crime, and, and, and ultimately bringing those responsible for it to, to justice. Uh, and and it, it, I'd hope it's not the case that um, it's anything other than easy to see that the predicate offences for, for, for money laundering crimes are significant in relation to the social damage they can cause. That's uh, human trafficking, that's fraud, that's the illegal arms trade. The one, though, that I particularly highlight, because I consider it to be the great enabler uh, for many of the crimes I've just mentioned, but also something that will undermine societies and, and undermine all of the policy goals that um, civil actors and governments seek to achieve is corruption. Uh, and and you know, banks can't solve that alone, uh, but they can certainly play a role and they can play a role in how they go about doing their business. They can play a role in how they go about doing compliance. And something I believe is one of the most important roles they can play is yes, to comply with the regulation. Clearly that degree of technical compliance is important. You know, we have to follow the law, but not to allow that to be sufficient. It's, it's necessary, but it shouldn't be sufficient. And what I believe, what we advocate for at Standard Chartered and what you know, organizations like the, the Wolfsburg Group argue for is balancing the system uh, you know, more heavily towards the effectiveness of output yeah. and, and more heavily towards, you know, uh, in addition to complying with the regulation, which we have to do, how do we also make sure we're generating really useful information for law enforcement that they can act on um, and they can use in pursuit of some of these underlying crimes? So that, that's, that's the great opportunity, I think, that exists out there. I think there's a, a, a really powerful role that banks can play. And I think if we, if we harness the system as a whole in, in pursuit of it, uh, you know, we can start to turn the tide at least on the battle against financial crime, um, because it's it's a battle that today we are not winning. It's a continuous evolving journey, right? And like you said, banks can't do this alone. Um, it, it is an ecosystem. It's the it's the value of of the bank's knowledge um, and and where they see money move. The partnership with regulators, um, and and partnership with tech vendors, suppliers consultants as well and it's a it's a combination of bringing all of those together um that we can really move the needle in this journey and and just coming back to sort of the last few years at standard charter bank um david so obviously the bank went through the um the monitorship um and um there's been obviously substantial investment uh, in tackling financial crime and and the controls and so on I mean, one thing that we've been supporting you and the team on is um, on the investigation side uh, of connecting those dots, as you as you um, uh, mentioned earlier. Could you just give a bit of a view on some of the 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 data uh, and some of the analytics um, and some of the the meeting the the machine with the human aspect and how that's gone in in the bank? Because a lot of the time you could have a very very shiny toy, right? And um, it looks all great. But um, how do you operationalize that? How do you roll that out to thousands of users? And, and some of those users is going to be, um, you know, different uh, in the way they, they, they go about um, investigating. Some might be looking at more complex cases, some might be looking at more simple cases. Just give a bit of a view around some of that journey around how you've got that data um, from those different markets, um, how you've applied the technology and how you've operationalized that out uh, within Standard Charter Bank. So I'll, 
I think three things come to mind in that space, Vish, as you as you ask the question. <clears throat> so item one, we've had to invest a lot of time, money and energy in uh, in what I might call data wrangling. So pulling <laughs> pulling the different uh, data sets together, making sure we understand what they are. Um, you know, one of our big lessons learned over the last several years has been the importance of data quality in, in what can be quite complex legacy technology and database environments. And I think a lot of banks will, will have that challenge to overcome. So, so a lot of energy into that to build up our data assets, if you like. I think that beyond that, two obvious use cases, and, and I think this is really important for these kind of programs, is to identify how you're then going to apply the tool. So uh, you know, one area, and I mentioned it earlier, was in support of, kind of standardizing how we deal with some of those volume in investigations. So it's providing a number of kind of preset views on the contextual information that you should be considering when you're looking at, uh, at an alert at a case. And I think that can work really well where you do have those tens of thousands of cases a month to work through because you can you can apply good practice in a more consistent way across uh, an analyst community that could be numbering certainly is numbering in our case uh, upwards of a thousand people uh, the second space then is tooling for those more complex investigations where I think you want to have much greater freedom of maneuver for the uh, for the people who are undertaking the investigation and, and really exposing the full power of, of, of the tool to go and discover um, linkages. Uh, those are my two use cases. Uh, if I project further forward though, I can see many others in, in the space that I focus on. Uh, but I think interestingly for, um, for Standard Chartered and, and and for others I expect as well, is what's the scope more effectively to use some of those assets for other use cases, for other business applications? And, and in a sense, some of the work we've done on um, cleaning data, wrangling data, assembling data over many years has, has front run uh, an agenda within uh, organizations around better use of data and analytics, not just for risk management purposes, but for uh, the development of the business, for new business opportunities. And, and, and ultimately, that's where it's got to get to, the, the, the bringing together of these kind of risk and control disciplines with um, the, way, the way the bank serves its clients. The, it all ultimately comes down to a clearer understanding of who your client is, what's expected for them and then um, servicing that where it's legitimate and stopping it where it's not. David, you, you, you hit the nail on the head, sir. I mean, obviously we're in a, a global pandemic um, and, you know, a lot of trust and a lot of um, goodwill and a lot of hope is on the vaccines coming through. How have you seen, David, from a, from a financial crime lens, has it changed during this pandemic, as things become and has become more digital. Um, you know, some people have said that the digital transformation has speeded up in, in three years down to nine months, yeah? Uh, some organizations have, have to evolve and be agile. But in all of these new ways of working and new ways of, of serving our clients, there's obviously gonna be new risks. Could you share some of your thoughts around some of those new emerging risks that you're seeing because of the pandemic and how and if does this stay for the future? Okay, so two things I'd think of there, Vish. So the first is the pandemic creates new opportunities for uh, criminal actors. Uh, it's created new opportunities for, for, for lots of people um, because we've all had to adapt to different ways of working and you know, we're both sat in our respective houses here. I'd far rather be, um, you know, sat, sat with you somewhere in, in one of our offices, but we found ways to make this work. 
criminal enterprises are going to be no different. So there is uh, lots of opportunity to go after government relief schemes, uh, to go after uh, general nervousness in the population, uh, to go after you know, the vaccine supply chain. It was the personal protective equipment supply chain uh, uh, in the early days of the pandemic. So, so I'd put that in one category, just a pivot of activity yeah. towards the specifics of the uh, of the environment. I think the second piece, though, which I suspect is a longer running trend, is that acceleration of digital that you've referenced. And that will be true also for criminal enterprises. So if, yeah. if one thinks about some of the challenge of money laundering in the analog world, bags of cash uh, and getting it into the system was a significant problem, still is a problem. But as cash becomes less um, prevalent for transactions and people um, move to, you know, whether it's cryptocurrencies or it's just digital digital variants of, of, uh, of fiat currencies, that's changing how that um, process works. So, so the money mule increasingly to worry about is not, it's not the cash money mule, it's the digital money mule. And it's the digital money mule in the form of a um, offshore shell company banking in a market um, on the other side of the world uh, that that is the the trend I fear is emerging in relation to how you really clean funds through the international financial system now. That kind of a trend I, I do not think is going away and we will be grappling with for, um, for, for many years to come. No, I, I completely, completely agree. And, and it, uh, it's very nice how you've put them into two different buckets there. And, and the second of those buckets is definitely going to be here way after um, this pandemic um, and that whole digital transformation, which which is a must. I mean, it, it's, the pandemic has only accelerated it. It, it was already happening. Um, you know, one you know one calls it the, the fourth um, industrial sort of revolution, right? And and we were in this. Uh, it's just speeded up now, and um, we must adapt. Um, and as you say, the those money mules um, and and looking at those money mules will change. Um, so that's definitely a, I, I to totally agree. In the future, with regards to sort of investigations and and building, um, you know, upon some of the earlier points you've said around investigations coming into sort of the detection and bringing that all together much more closer. How do you see the role of technology, analytics, um, machine learning, the cloud play into that? Uh, because again, within Standard Chartered and outside of Standard Chartered, um, we're seeing this as, as common themes, as common investment areas into you know, your data, into your analytics, into machine learning, into technology and into the cloud. And obviously the bank is on a, a tremendous journey around cloud and, and being cloud first. Um, do you want to just share some of your views around financial crime in, in, those, in that lens? I, so I think, Vish, it's, it's, the benefit's probably going to be bringing greater processing power at scale to some of the, um, some of the work that we're already seeking to do. It's interesting that, to my mind at least, there's, there's going to be a couple of big challenges to solve within some of that. So, so one will be, how do we make sure that the product from it is, is of value to the investigators? Because I can, you know, the flip side to all of that capability is that you, you overwhelm people. Yeah. Um, so I think if we, if, we, if we keep some of those core disciplines in mind, such as starting with a hypothesis that you can test, <laughs> uh, rather than sort of fishing in a, 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 a Marianas trench of data, uh, I, I think that's going to be quite an important risk to manage where you could just get lost. Yeah. Um, I think the second thing that will be really interesting to solve for is how we go about managing all of that capability with the right respect for privacy. And 
you know, if I see that as another major trend uh, in uh, in certainly some of our markets and and uh, and how we ensure that we're uh, uh, compliant with with all of those requirements, but also that the underlying objectives of them are being similarly uh, are similarly managed. Uh, we've got to be very thoughtful about you know, not crossing uh, any of those boundaries in in taking advantage of of the tools and the power that they offer. Um, so no doubt, massive opportunity there, but but we've got to be thoughtful about how we use it, or, or we might not realise the opportunity. I think I think you touch upon a very a very uh, sensitive important point there, David. Once again, I want to thank you for your time this morning. It's been a very enjoyable session. And, you know, my final point, thank you for all your hard work, your team's hard work to make our communities safer. Um, So thanks again. And thanks again for your time this morning. It was great catching up with you, Vish. Really good to see you.